Hello, good officially afternoon, uh, or almost afternoon. I am Brent Steele, a professor of political science and Francis D. Wormuth presidential chair. Thank you all for being here today. This talk, is co this talk, co hosted with the Hinckley Institute, is made possible what, by the Wormuth chair, uh, a position that I've held for the last decade. And it's been a part of a series of talks and partnerships with Hinckley throughout that period of time. These talks uh, in the Wormuth uh, series have focused on insights and issues in international relations, uh, international ethics, and US politics. I'll now turn it over to uh, William Betterbide of the Hinckley Institute to introduce the guest speaker, my friend, colleague, and collaborator, Eric Heinze. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Hinckley Forum. My name is William Betterbide. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. Today's forum is titled Self-Defense in International Relations and Law, and is presented as part of the Wormuth Endowed Lecture Series. We want to thank the Political Science Department and Professor Brent Steele for their leadership in organizing this event. We are excited to be joined by Eric A. Heinze, a professor at David L. Boren College of International Studies at the University of Oklahoma. He is currently the holder of the Max and Heidi Berry Chair of International Studies and serves as Interim Associate Dean. Trained as a political scientist, Dr. Heinze teaches courses in the field of international relations, including classes on international law and institutions, international human rights, ethics, and IR and IR theory. Professor Heinze's research deals with ethical and legal issues in international relations with a focus on international norms pertaining to armed conflict, human rights, and genocide and mass atrocity. His current and recent work is on humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to protect international law and non-state armed groups, and the law and ethics of limited wars. Please join me in welcoming our guest. Thank you very much for those very flattering introductions. It's really great to be here at the University of Utah in your beautiful city and your beautiful campus to see all the things that we uh, don't necessarily have uh, back in Oklahoma, as I was just uh, commenting to uh, one of the members of the audience. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about uh, self-defense in international relations and law. Uh, but before I get into my talk, I thought I would just go over a couple preliminary things. Um, first, um, I, I think what I'll do is just go ahead and go over my comments and sort of lay out uh, my argument. And then if people want to talk about specific cases, we can do that in the Q&A. So I won't plan on going over any specific cases other than sort of re rather broadly uh, in my prepared remarks. And the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, sort of a conceptual issue, uh, a difference between two concepts that are very important to people like me who study the law and ethics of armed conflict. And that is the difference between jus ad bellum and jus in bello. Uh, jus ad bellum, of course, these are Latin terms, refers to those rules of war that are pertinent to um, whether or not the war itself was justified, whether it was just to go to war in the first place, okay? Uh, use in bello refers to those rules pertinent to the means and methods of the war, right? So quite separately from whether the war itself was just to undertake or lawful to undertake, are the means and methods that the uh, participants in this armed conflict undertaking, are they legal, ethical, moral, et cetera, right? And these are two separate concerns that we often deal with in the law and ethics of war. Uh, and I just wanna be very clear that I'm talking about the former. I'm talking about jus ad bellum. I'm talking about those rules uh, that uh, pertain to when it is just legal, ethical to go to war, right? Which is a separate question from whether or not you're using lawful or ethical means and methods, okay? So with that, the right of states to use military force in self-defense if they are the victim of an armed attack is one of the central rights that states have today. Article 51 of the UN Charter makes this abundantly clear, uh, and self-defense is perhaps the least contested legal basis for a state resorting to the use of military force. And I've reproduced uh, Article 51 in its entirety for you. I won't insult your intelligence and read it for you, uh, but there's a couple of uh, pertinent terms in that definition. In particular, the inherent right uh, of self-defense, 
and also uh, the concept of an armed attack. And I tried to put these in bold uh, up there to highlight them, but it doesn't appear it showed up particularly well, but that's okay. While this definition seems relatively straightforward, it's been the subject of a surprising amount of debate among states, international lawyers, uh, as well as international judicial bodies. And there are a couple different debates about the right to self-defense in Article 51 that have come to the fore over the past several decades. Perhaps the one that most of us are most familiar with has to do with whether a state literally has to wait until it is the victim of an armed attack before it can resort to force in self-defense, or if it can use, in, use force in anticipation of an armed attack, that is so-called anticipatory self-defense. This debate, of course, was prominent around the time of the Iraq War, uh, which we were told was an act of preemptive self-defense. Uh, but if you look at Article 51, if you take it literally, it seems to require that a victim state must patiently wait and absorb the first assault uh, until it can lawfully resort to military force in self-defense. However, as a lot of people have pointed out, this seems like a rather absurd interpretation of Article 51, which would be to prohibit a state from defending itself when an attack against it is imminent. Uh, and today, actually, the general view is that a state does not have to wait until it is actually attacked to use force in self-defense, but can do so uh, if an attack against it is imminent, okay? But how do we get to this from the plain text of Article 51? It says nothing about preemption, uh, prevention, or anticipatory self-defense, much less non-state actors, which is what I wanna eventually get to uh, in this talk. In short, it has to do with the word inherent uh, found in Article 51, a state's inherent right to self-defense. In other words, the reference to the inherent right to self-defense indicates a couple of different things. First, I think it indicates an acknowledgement that the right to self-defense was not invented by Article 51 and existed well before the UN Charter as part of what we call customary international law, which is international law that is derived from consistent patterns of state practice over time. For the purposes of anticipatory self-defense, if we look at the right to self-defense prior to the UN Charter, we learned that international law did, in fact, recognize a right to what is known as preemptive self-defense, which is different, of course, from preventive self-defense. In other words, customary international law prior to the advent of the UN Charter in 1945 recognized the right of states to use force in self-defense of an attack that was imminent against it. Or in the words of former U.S. Secretary of State Daniel Webster, when the attack against it is, quote, instant, overwhelming, leaving no choice of means and no moment for deliberation, which was the standard that he articulated in the so-called Caroline Doctrine of 1842, which is now understood to constitute sort of the customary international law standard for preemptive self-defense. So when the Bush administration was trying to justify the 2003 Iraq War, it deliberately conflated, I think, uh, yeah, no, I'm on the right slide. Uh, it deliberately conflated preemptive and preventive self-defense for reasons that might be obvious. Preemptive self-defense is recognized under international law and preventive self-defense is not. And the basic difference between preemptive and preventive self-defense is the degree of imminence of the attack against you. Preemptive self-defense entails an attack against you that is imminent or has actually already started and you are simply you know, beating them to the punch. Preventive self-defense is when a state uh, uses self-defensive force against another state that may or may not have the intention or the capability to attack it at some point in the future, but an attack against them is not imminent at the time. Yet this reference to the inherent right to self-defense in Article 51 also suggests that the right to self-defense, insofar as it is also part of customary international law, can and has evolved over the decades in light of states' evolving understanding and interpretation of it. Excuse me for a second while I get a drink. And so that's what I want to talk about for the rest uh, of this lecture here today. How the right to self-defense has continued to evolve in the past couple of decades, especially in light of the increasing role of non-state armed groups in contemporary warfare. As we all know, over the past couple of decades, numerous states have been the victims of large-scale attacks that are perpetrated by non-state actors. Uh, of course, we have the 9-11 attacks, 
Uh, we have scores of non-state armed groups waging war in sub-Saharan Africa throughout the early 2000s. Uh, we have separatist, separatist groups routinely attacking states like Pakistan and India uh, from the territory of neighboring countries. We have groups like ISIS, uh, the Islamic State, actually conquering territory and attacking numerous countries, including Iran, Iraq, Syria, and others. Uh, and of course, we have uh, militant groups like Hamas uh, undertaking armed attacks against Israel. But what is interesting is that despite the fact that non-state actors have been part of the international landscape since well before 9-11, is that throughout much of the Cold War, the prevailing interpretation of the right to self-defense was that the right to self-defense only applied to attacks perpetrated by state actors, okay? In other words, for a state to use force or, or for a use of force to qualify as an armed attack that would give a state the right to use force in self-defense under Article 51, First of all, it had to reach a certain scale and effect, which is to say a level of severity, uh, and it had to be undertaken by a state actor. Or if it was not, the act had to be attributable to a state actor, with the debate then centering on the nature of the relationship between the non-state actor and the state. Now regarding scale and effect, um, it's important to note that not all uses of military force will cross the threshold to be considered an armed attack. So there is a difference in principle between a mere use of force and an actual armed attack, uh, which is understood to be more severe and destructive. Now, where this threshold lies, of course, is subject to some debate. Uh, and the International Court of Justice has suggested that an armed attack is more than frontier incidents, border skirmishes, or small arms fire. But what we usually look for are uses of force that produce serious consequences, epitomized by territorial intrusions, large-scale human casualties, or considerable destruction of property. But the notion that only states are capable of undertaking an armed attack is supported by a number of international legal sources, including the United Nations General Assembly Declaration, or I'm sorry, Definition of Aggression Resolution of 1974, which defined the act of aggression as consisting of attacks by the armed forces of a state or sending of armed bands, groups, irregulars, or mercenaries by a state for the purposes of undertaking such attacks. This general formulation has been further refined and reinforced by the International Court of Justice, uh, which said that in order to qualify as an armed attack, a non-state actor had to be under the, quote, effective control of a state and literally ordered or sent on its behalf. It also concluded that the supply of weapons and other support, like logistical support, would not be a sufficient nexus such that the acts of non-state actors could be attributed to states. And this general standard was reiterated, reiterated a couple more times uh, in ICJ opinions in the DRC versus Uganda case, as well as the Wall advisory opinion. And it's also consistent with the International Law Commission's views on state responsibility, wherein they conclude that the actions of non-state actors may be attributed to states if the entity is, quote, acting on the instructions of or under the direction or control of the state in carrying out the conduct. So why is or was, I suppose, international law like this or interpreted like this? Especially when you look at Article 51, which says nothing about states or non-state actors being a requirement for an armed attack having occurred. And we know with certainty that non-states can and have undertaken attacks that are every bit as destructive as those undertaken by states. Well, I think the reason is, is that when the United Nations was founded and the UN Charter entered into law, threats from non-state armed groups were not nearly as pronounced as they are today. And we certainly didn't have the same threat of global terrorism and from global terrorist groups that we have had over the past 20, 25 years or so. And to the extent that there were non-state armed groups that did pose threats to states during this period, they tended to be challenges from within the state, not from abroad. And so were treated entirely as internal matters that did not necessarily implicate international law. These groups were also not considered to be subjects of international law, and so could only implicate international law if they were connected to a state, okay? But the reality is, is that in 1945 and earlier, the drafters of the UN Charter and the various legal bodies interpreting it during the Cold War did not have international terrorism in mind when they were delineating the rules of self-defense. 
Again, terrorism until fairly recently was a threat that emanated from within and not necessarily from abroad. And so my own observation and the observation of others, I'm hardly the only one to make this observation, is that this started to change in the early 21st century. The states began to consider specifically terrorist attacks as armed attacks for the purposes of self-defense. Indeed, after the 9-11 attacks, the United States invoked its right to self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter to commence its invasion of Afghanistan, and it directed self-defensive measures against both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, both a state and a non-state actor. Interestingly enough, the US action was nearly universally supported, with a few exceptions, the usual suspects, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea, of course, objected to what the United States was doing. Uh, but importantly, the UN Security Council passed at least two resolutions affirming the United States, quote, inherent right to self-defense. So based on this international reaction, it seemed clear that most states and international bodies accepted that the 9-11 attacks gave the United States the legal right to use force against both the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in self-defense. And this support is significant because it was not at all clear that Al-Qaeda was acting on behalf of a state actor or the Taliban. And we know now, actually, that the Taliban was not even close to exercising effective control over Al-Qaeda. So at least based on this case, I think it's safe to say that states appear to recognize that states started to, that, that a state can use an attack by a non-state actor as a basis to invoke Article 51. And subsequent state practice has seemed to further refine this legal evolution, as numerous states after 9-11 would cite the US response to the 9-11 attacks to justify their own military measures against states operating from near, nearby or neighboring states, oftentimes without much objection from the international community. And there's literally dozens of cases that we could talk about in this regard. Uh, there were Russian airstrikes uh, in Chechnya in 2002, uh, airstrikes by Colombia against the FARC uh, terrorist organization uh, inside of Ecuador in, in 2008. Uh, we get attacks by uh, Ethiopia and Kenya in the territory of Somalia against the Al-Shabaab terrorist network. Uh, we get Egyptian airstrikes in 2015 against ISIS-affiliated groups in neighboring Libya. And there are dozens and dozens of, exa of examples of states using military force in response to terrorist attacks against them emanating from other states. But I would also ask us to consider also the various actions of Western and Arab states against ISIS. Uh, operating in Iraq and Syria that all began around August of 2014. While the coalition attacks against ISIS within Iraqi territory were relatively uncontroversial because Iraq had consented to the campaign in its territory, the actions in Syria were not done with the permission of the Syrian government and were, of course, more controversial. Nevertheless, the reactions of most states to the action by coalition forces suggests that states were again willing to accept the idea that non-state actors could be responsible for armed attacks for the purposes of Article 51. But what many states were reluctant to accept was the more expansive argument being made by the United States that since Syria was unwilling or unable to prevent its territory from being used uh, by terrorists to carry out attacks, then coalition forces could direct self-defensive measures against ISIS in Syrian territory, even without the permission of Syria. Now, eventually, the Security Council appeared to provide legal authority or legal cover for coalition, to use force, coalition forces to use military force in Syria. Um, this was after ISIS bombed a, a Russian airliner over Egypt, which killed hundreds of people, and after the, uh, uh, an ISIS attack at a, a concert hall in France that killed you know, dozens of, of more people. The UN Security Council gave legal cover for bombing campaigns in Syria. But up until that time, they'd been relying on this sort of uh, unwilling or unable doctrine as the legal justification for those actions. But the so-called unwilling or unable doctrine, which is currently being debated by states and international legal authorities, is still a fairly controversial proposition. But what at least seems to be the emerging consensus is that states have the right to use self-defense against non-state actors whose attacks cannot be attributed to a state. And this consensus is slowly starting to make its way into the work of major bodies like the International Law Association, which has recently endorsed such a formulation. <clears throat> 
So what then are the implications of the evolution of international law in this respect? Well, in principle, I suppose it might create a deterrent for states from allowing their territory to be used by terrorist groups or other non-state actors to export violence if they know that their territory is going to be used uh, in this way or if it's going to be attacked as a result. Uh, this would effectively increase a state's liability for unlawful acts that take place in their boundaries, which I suppose, you know, if this is all true, would be a, a positive development. Uh, on the other hand, it seems to be a definite loosening of the normative and legal constraints on the use of force in international affairs, potentially leading to more conflict. Also, attributing international responsibility to non-state actors, particularly terrorist groups, is also to some extent to recognize them as legal entities um, and would be to recognize them as sources of authority within a state's territory at the expense of the existing government. And while I suppose this is a you know, logical way uh, for the law to evolve in light of this international security, re security reality, it would require that terrorist groups, groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so on, be granted at least limited international legal personality, giving them a, a broader set of rights and duties under international law, and thus, in a sense, legitimating them, right? Ultimately, though, my observation is that states have increasingly accepted that non-state actors can carry out armed attacks for the purposes of Article 51, and that victim states have the right to use military force in response, even potentially at times in the territory of other states without their permission. While this does not at all suggest an unlimited right to self-defense, it does reflect the changing reality in world politics that for some time now, uh, the threat of war and conflict faced by states does not exclusively emanate from other states. And the evolution of these rules is simply the international legal system catching up with this political reality. Thank you. So I would be thrilled to take questions and have a broader discussion about how this might apply to any particular cases, historical or contemporary, or if anyone has any questions about uh, any other aspects of international law and the use of force, I'd be happy to engage in a more broad-based discussion. So, Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's been really, you know, it's a double-edged sword to talk about how international law has evolved over the past 25 years because it appears we've seen a loosening, as I said, of the constraints on the use of force, right? It's, it's a good thing to allow states to defend themselves when they're under attack, uh, but if you give them too much license, they'll take as much as they can get and use this as a basis to justify things that are not self-defense, right? Um, and states will try to advance the strongest legal case for their use of force that they can, right? Because the, the, the stronger their legal argument, the less political opposition potentially they're going to have. Um, and so even if they know that what they're doing is manifestly illegal, they're going to try to make the best argument that they can in favor of its legality. Um, this is what we saw in, in the Iraq invasion where the United States basically threw the kitchen sink uh, at trying to make arguments for, for in favor of that war. Um, and, you know, people take notice, right? States changing their behavior and interpreting international law in more permissive ways actually does, over time, change what international law says if you believe that uh, state practice has the capability to change uh, treaty principles, which it's also sort of a debatable proposition. A quick yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I think it does. I mean, this, I get this question all the time when I teach international law, right? States violate it with impunity, nothing seems to happen. Why do we even have rules that outlaw or try to regulate the use of force if states are just going to routinely violate it? And I still think it's important to have these rules because when it does become obvious or when it is obvious that states have violated them, such as, in my opinion, and I think in the opinions of most observers, the 2003 Iraq War seemed to be, to me, manifestly in violation of the rules of the UN Charter. This actually made it more difficult for the United States to achieve its goals in Iraq because the whole world, more or less, except you know, with a handful of countries, uh, were opposed to this be precisely because it was unlawful and other reasons as well, right? And this actually made it much more difficult for the United States to try to achieve its goals uh, in Iraq. Uh, 
so I think for if no other reason, it's important that we have international law because even though states are going to violate it sort of at will, we need to have principles that allow us to hold them accountable to say, look, what you're doing is wrong because we have these rules that constitute the international system. By the way, United States, which you helped create, um, and you're not abiding by them. So you know this is a way to ensure that these countries try to take them serious. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, is there any standard or like rule for procedure that divides state and non-state actors? Right. For example, Taliban claims to be the rule for state of the region they're occupying, right? And I'm from Korea, and even my country used to have this provisional government that tried to plead the international society to like, acknowledge them as the rule for state. So like, is there any precise rule or regulation that decides whether some organization is state or non-state actor? Um, well, I suppose you know, the UN would be the ultimate authority to, to decide whether or not an entity is a state or not, like a territorial entity. But what separates you, you know, uh, an, a territorial entity that is a state from a non-state is simply recognition by other states. Um, you know, there are some objective criteria that we point to. They're called the Montevideo criteria. They come from a treaty uh, almost 100 years old. Um, but what is more decisive in determining whether or not an entity is a state is whether or not it's treated like a state by other states, right? So Taiwan being the pertinent example. Taiwan. Uh, meets probably all of the objective requirements for statehood of having a territory, a government, and boundaries, and foreign affairs, and so on, right? But it's not a state. Um, why? Well, power matters, of course, but because it's not recognized by a sufficient number of other states to be considered a state. And the reason for that, of course, has to do with the power of China and Chinese influence over Taiwan and affairs that go on in the strait. Um, so really, the difference between a state and a non-state actor is kind of an arbitrary distinction. We do have these objective criteria that we can apply from the Montevideo Convention, but the more decisive thing is the opinions of other states, right? Um, another example might be uh, Palestine or the Palestinian territories. Palestine is not a member of the United Nations, but they are a non-state observer entity. Uh, and by the way, about 140 other countries recognize Palestine as a state. Now, the United States doesn't for arbitrary, probably political reasons. Uh, but for all practical purposes, Palestine is a state. The Palestinian territories are considered broadly to be a state in this regard. I don't know if that answers your question, but maybe sort of a long-winded way of addressing it. Is, that, is this a follow-up or? Yeah, yeah. Um, the UN doesn't, but the UN usually refers to the Montevideo criteria, which are territory, permanent population, uh, international boundaries, and having the capability to engage in foreign relations I'm sorry, without being interfered with by others. But to be a member of the United Nations, which is not coterminous with being a state, uh, you have to be, it requires a, a two-thirds vote of the General Assembly uh, and nine out of 15 votes on the Security Council, and it must survive the veto. So the P5 can veto membership in the UN if they want to, which is precisely why Taiwan and Palestine are not members of the United Nations, as states anyway. Uh, Steve. Yeah, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. I was fascinated by the way in which you were talking about how when uh, states respond uh, outside their borders to non-state actors and the way in which that might confer legitimacy on those non-state actors yeah. in unintentional ways. I'm wondering, can you play that out? What, what would that look like? Because that's yeah. a disturbing development. I wonder how that would grow yeah. or what that so, is. So um, under, this is use, at, use uh, in Bello, uh, the Geneva Conventions and their uh, additional protocols, um, once a non-state actor, like this is in the case of civil wars, armed conflicts of a non-international character, as they're known in international law. Once a non-state rebel movement, say, meets a certain set of criteria, such as sometimes controlling territory, uh, having separate political and military wings, operating in a hierarchy, uh, and that sort of thing, they become, for the purposes of international law, a lawful belligerent. Um, in which case, they not only have duties under international law, such as at that point they become, they have to require, they're required to uh, abide by the rules of war, the Geneva Conventions, at least those which apply to non-international armed conflicts, but they're given rights under international law as well. They are recognized as separate legal entities uh, for the purposes of international law. 
And the way that part of the way that international law evolves, in addition to creating more treaties, is through state practice and the practice of actors whose action uh, legitimates what's going on. And to the extent that these non-state actors are engaging in this activity with states, then it is their actions, not just the actions of states, which are subsequently determine the content of international law. And so in this sense, international law is not just constituted by you know, state actions and state practice, but that of non-states as well, because they are international legal entities that have rights and duties under international law. So in my, in my I guess, what I was thinking here is that this puts them, you know, if not practically, then legally on sort of equal footing as states, which in my view could be you know, bestowing a certain sense of legitimacy, which might be objectionable to, to certain states. It also- that's the problem, I think, there's some entities where you could say, oh, that's a good thing, we want that, but others like ISIS, we don't want that. Right, right, yeah, and you know, at that point it becomes sort of arbitrary to decide, you know, and, and states are gonna have difference of opinion on that. Uh, and there are, of course, other non-state actors that have you know, international legal personality. Intergovernmental organizations like the UN and then the World Trade Organization are also actors in their own right. Um, and that's, that development basically came about so people could sue them, so people could sue these international organizations. Um, and I suppose you might uh, have a similar type of reality in, insofar as these actors are groups that have their own legal personality. Can they held, be held accountable or in the foreseeable future, can we imagine them being held accountable the same way states are in front of the International Court of Justice or other international legal bodies? So that's sort of the concern or the, the possibility that I raise in, in that context. And then there's, in the back, you've been patiently waiting. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so I have uh, two questions. I believe I can um, join them. The first question is about attribution. Like, how do you... Uh, question the attribution because I think that would be very important. So for instance, uh, Pakistan and Iran, they conducted airstrikes into each other uh, yeah. territories like a few days ago. So my question is like, if, you, if one state believes that the attack was conducted by a non-state actor and they are attributing it to a non-state actor, I think that would uh, imply a different um, interpre interpretation yeah. of law. Whereas if they are attributing it to a state, that would be different. That's uh, one question. And Related to that would be uh, the recent um, strikes by U.S. on Yemen. Like, what if a group is ineffective control of most of the territory? Like, then you would attribute it to the government or to the rebels? Like, uh, yeah, in, in Yemen. Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, the point on attribution uh, first. Um, so, if if there is a situation where a country wants to respond to an attack by a non-state actor that's not been attributed to a state. What I'm arguing is that they could potentially do so, again, limiting their self-defensive measures to the non-state actor in the territory of another state without that state's permission, right? But the, importantly, they wouldn't be directing self-defensive measures against that state itself, if that makes sense. However, if the standard for attribution uh, is met, let's say that you know this country uh, you know, armed them, trained them, and commanded them to undertake this attack, then that could potentially open up the state itself to self-defensive measures, where they're not just directing force against, say, you know, these terrorist bases located wherever, they're directing force against the government and military of that state, which is, I think, a, a, a higher escalation, uh, if you will. Uh, in terms of the strikes against Yemen, um, undertaken by the United States. This actually raises a whole other subject that I, I kind of wanted to talk about but didn't know if I would have time. And, th and that is that of reprisals, armed reprisals, uh, which are basically uses of military force that fall just under the threshold uh, of an armed attack to avoid escalation uh, and to avoid you know, retaliation, basically. Uh, but in this particular case, um, I think you could actually argue that these attacks coming from Yemen are coming from a state actor because the Houthis control the capital uh, and a majority of the territory of, of Yemen. So my own view is that the Houthis have become the de facto government in, in Yemen and that these attacks uh, by the Houthis are undertaken by a state. And so I don't really think we need to undertake the analysis of attribution and the whole non-state actor thing in that particular case. What's interesting though is if you look at US strikes against the Houthis and really against other targets in, in uh, Iraq and Syria that are actually still taking place as we speak, uh, 
they've been very calculated. They've been calculated to uh, not kill people, for one. They haven't really caused a, a lot of casualties. They've been at facilities, launch sites, you know, weapons depots, that sort of thing. And by the way, they've been given plenty of warning. Uh, the Biden administration basically gave them a, a week or two of announcing, yep, we're gonna, at the time and place of our choosing, you know, do this, that, and the other. Uh, so they have plenty of warning. That is sort of the, uh, the sign point of a reprisal, right? Of a use of force by a state in response to something illegal that was done against them or something that harmed them, uh, basically to say, hey, stop that, right? It's not to provide self-defense, right? It's to deter them from doing it in the future. Well, supposedly this, this was legislated out of existence by the UN Charter in 1945, but states never stopped doing it. States continued to use reprisals as a tool of statecraft throughout the Cold War, and I would say increasingly now with the advent of you know, non-state armed groups, and now even more so with the advent of cyber attacks, right? Which is a whole other <laughs> you know, uh, conversation uh, to have when it comes to self-defense. Sorry again with the long-winded answer, but I hope that at least answers your question somewhat. Uh, yes, sir, and then I don't want to neglect this side of the room as well. So would changing definitions within just war theory or the theory itself also have effects on R2P, specifically in the context of an international organization or third-party state from intervening in another state? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, what was, could you repeat that maybe? And I seem like you put a lot of thought into that question, so I want to make sure I have it. I'm taking a lot of international intervention classes this okay. semester. Okay. Uh, so would changing definitions within just war theory or the theory itself, like adding non-state actors in legal, like law, um, also have effects on R2P, specifically in the context of an international organization like the United Nations or a third party state from intervening in another state? Um, so just war theory is not something that's codified as a set of standards that are to be applied, necessarily. Uh, just war theory is basically the 2,000-year-old conversation about the legitimacy of war. It's continuously evolving, and there's no sort of one true just war theory. There are actually many different just war theories, and there's a debate within just war theory about you know, armed conflicts being you know, morally justified or, or, or not. And in fact, just war theory has a very long tradition of dealing with non-state actors. The just war tradition has been around before the state system was around. Uh, and so necessarily they were theorizing uh, about wars with non-state actors and they apparently didn't seem to have a problem with that uh, to the same extent that uh, international law does. Um, but it's also the case that much of international law uh, is derived from the ethical principles found in, in just war theory. Uh, and so I think we can see that to a certain extent when we see that at least international law is making room for civil wars uh, and delineating rules under which you know, rebel movements come under the, uh, the authority of international law. Uh, but I think you know, just to, to change principles and definitions in, in just war theory, I mean, you can do that, but that's just to engage in a debate within the just war theory canon. That's not necessarily going to downstream affect international law or, or whatever the case may be. Um, with respect to R2P, the responsibility to protect, uh, which is something I've written about uh, a lot, um, this is basically a, a, a principle that tries to create a consensus about when it would be legitimate to use military force in another state for humanitarian purposes, right? Like if there's a genocide going on, you know, under what conditions is it you know, legitimate, and they've stopped short of calling it legal, uh, for states to do this, right? So right now, under international law, there's only two situations when it's legal to use military force in self-defense under Article 51, and second is when authorized by the UN Security Council as a peace enforcement operation. Anything else is illegal, even if it's attempting to stop a genocide, okay? Um, there was an attempt for R2P to be sort of, you know, institutionalized as customary international law over time, and that was really the intention behind R2P was to get states to endorse this rhetorically and to get their action to follow suit with the hope that you know, maybe this would affect international law over time. The problem is, is that most states rejected R2P. Uh, and R2P, as my colleague Aidan Hayher has uh, articulated, is a hollow norm. Uh, there's a lot of advocacy surrounding R2P by you know, UN types, diplomats, NGO types, but very few states have endorsed the original uh, 
uh, version of R2P. Now, they endorsed a, uh, endorsed a version of it in 2005, which was a heavily watered down one, which basically put everything back into the hands of the Security Council. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or if that gives you some more stuff to chew on, but uh, for what it's worth. Uh, over here, yes. Um, what's the justification for like civilian casualties or when other innocent people like die? Yeah, so this would apply to any conflict, not just against non-state actors, but state-to-state -state, um, conflicts as well. Uh, and this is importantly a question of use in bellow, the means and methods of war. Uh, how are civilian casualties justified? Um, <laughs> it's, it's hard, um, but the basic rules of, of use in bello as flowing from the Geneva Convention say that as long as civilians are not the deliberate object of the attack, which is to say as long as civilians aren't purposefully targeted, uh, that their deaths are incidental and not necessarily criminal, subject to proportionality calculations. Um, so if a state decides that it's going to bomb, you know, some you know, military base, right? And it calculates that it can bomb that and take it out and there's going to be, let's say, 10 civilian casualties. And it knows this ahead of time, right? Uh, as long as the, um, and this is a proportionality calculation, as long as the value of taking out that target is greater than the negative effects of killing those civilians, then we say it's proportionate. The problem is you're comparing apples and oranges. How do you compare the military necessity of taking out a particular target to 10 innocent civilians dying, right? Uh, and so it's virtually an impossible calculation to make, but military planners and commanders try. Uh, but you know, consider another hypothetical example. What if they know ahead of time that it's going to take out 500 civilian, you know, there's gonna be 500 people killed. Then that might be a basis for them to conclude, well, this probably would be a disproportionate attack, even though those civilians would not be the objects of the attack, right? So it has to do with the intentions of the attacker. Are they deliberately uh, attacking civilians or are they not? And it has to do with um, the proportionality of it. Are so many civilians being killed in that attack that it eclipses any material uh, military value that taking that target out happened to have in the first place. Does that answer your question? It's really a, a tough question because as I said, you're comparing apples and oranges, right? You're comparing military necessity against harm against the civilian population. And that's, you know, a very tough thing to, uh, to try and calculate. And of course, it's come up appropriately so in the context of the Israel-Hamas conflict where we're just seeing just astounding numbers of civilian casualties, right? Um, making us question this, as we should. Yeah. Um, so going back to the, thank you for the talk. Sure, sure. Um, going back to the conversation about ambigu ambiguity of states, what is like the moral, I don't know, undertones of, of a recognized state that doesn't recognize another state that, that invades? Like I'm thinking like Western Sahara, mm -hmm. or Palestine, or, yeah. Um, so a state that recognizes another state, what are the... Yeah, I get like the, so like going back to like the ambiguous like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. State, uh -huh. um, what are the moral justifications of... of like non-recognition, why they... Yeah, like a recognized, so a state that doesn't recognize another state, mm -hmm. but that state is recognized by other states. Okay. Is that, what is like the moral... So I'm reluctant to say there's really any moral calculus that goes into that. States recognize states, other states, largely out of political expediency, right? Um, now they could, I suppose, you know, make the arguments like, well, we're, we're gonna recognize you because you know, you're the de facto authority, you control territory, you have a functioning government, and all, the, all these other things. But they usually do so for sort of arbitrary and political reasons. And I'll give you an example. Uh, in the early 1990s, I'm sorry my <laughs> examples are so dated, um, uh, Yugoslavia was breaking up, right? Uh, and so it was breaking up into these constituent components. Um, and the European community, which was the European community at the time, it was pre-Maastricht, um, recognized, I think it was Slovenia and Croatia, almost the next day. They declared independence and they recognized them as states almost the next day, basically to bestow legitimacy on them, to both bestow legitimacy on their uh, declarations of independence. Even though they had not achieved any 
of the objective criteria of statehood. They did not control their territory. They did not have functioning governments. Uh, their population was moving between you know, boundaries and so on, and they didn't have foreign relations with other uh, countries. And so a lot of people have argued that this premature recognition, which the European community did for political reasons to try and lend legitimacy to their uh, cause, arguably caused the Serbs to fight that much harder to prevent them from seceding, thus contributing to more bloodshed. At least that's what people like Richard Holbrook and others uh, have argued over the years. Whether or not that's true, I don't know. But I suppose, you know, because recognition of states in practice is such an arbitrary activity, uh, it can have negative uh, implications, such as here. Um, I mean, another example is, is Kosovo, right, from this same uh, instance. Uh, Kosovo has declared, it declared its independence like 15 years ago. Uh, it got a whole bunch of countries to recognize it, NATO countries, right? Uh, but Russia and sort of the you know, former Soviet co uh, countries won't. And these are all for historic reasons and so on and so forth, right? Kosovo probably doesn't meet the definition objectively of a state, but it's being recognized by some and others merely out of political expedience. And so unfortunately, this business of statehood has become politicized like everything else. Um, for what it's worth. Um, uh, yes, sir. And then. Uh, you're saying that the principle of bringing the war, the horrors of war to the civilian population would violate these laws. And that pretty much began in, in practice with Sherman and then moved on up to the fire bombings of World War II. Most of those fire bombings had no particular target other than yeah. the city in mind. So you'd, you'd lump that in as a, well, not necessarily a uh, consequence that didn't have any uh, legitimate standing? Um, I, I guess I'm not sure what, what you're asking in terms of, I mean, clearly the fire bombings of... Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Fire bombing of, of Dresden, you know, even arguably the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, you know, where... You know, you could say that, uh, that the object of the attacks was not civilians, but the damage to civilians was so uh, incredible that arguably it eclipsed any advantage that then that was accrued. But then other people would say, well, that was an acceptable price to pay for ending, you know, the Pacific theater, except for this whole unconditional surrender business, which is a whole other thing that just war theorists have talked about. But uh, someone that hasn't had a chance to ask a question, yeah. Um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit more about Yemen. Uh, I had a question that was kind of answered earlier, the, uh, the status of Ansarallah, also known as the Houthis, who, like you said, r represent kind of a semi-state or a de facto state mm -hmm. in this conflict, right? So I know you're a scholar of R2P, um, and Ansarallah, the Ansarallah government of Yemen has explicitly invoked R2P um, to shut down shipping that is linked to Israel and to Israel's Western co-belligerents through their territorial waters mm -hmm. through the Bab el Mandeb Strait. Um, so, I guess kind of a multi-per question, like one, R2P, as far as I'm aware, has been exclusively used by the West to justify its interventions. It, it, this seems to be the first time it is being used against the West. Um, uh, so I was wondering if there's like any historical parallels there. Um, similarly, how, I guess, the R2P doctrine interacts with Ansarallah's status as a semi-state, that is de facto a state, but de jure, um, the actual Yemeni government is in a Saudi hotel. Um, and then the other part of this question that I wanted to ask um, is to what extent then, given that the ICJ has ruled that Israel is plausibly committing genocide, and given that this plausible genocide is Yemen's um, justification for the R2P intervention, then to what extent does the West, does the US and the UK have legitimacy to respond by bombing Yemeni targets? Okay, let me try to Sorry, get very to large question. If, if, Sorry I miss, about that. if I miss some of those, please come remind me, because I want to, uh, get everything. So in far, as far as R2P being invoked by the Houthis, uh, this is actually significant because it's the first time, I don't know if it's the first time, uh, but it is certainly a significant instance in that here we have a relatively small and weak government invoking R2P uh, to justify its, its military activities. Whereas before it had been, as you point out, principally West Western uh, governments using it to justify things that 
perhaps weren't even R2P type activities, right? Maybe using them as a pretext. But I would also point out that it's not just Western governments that had used it. Russia has used it a couple times. It used it when it invaded Georgia in 2008, and it's used it in Ukraine uh, over the past couple years. And they're decidedly non-Western, right? Uh, and so, you know, Russia has basically used uh, its, this justification basically that, you know, there's genocide being, being committed here, and we're going into, you know, uh, prevent a genocide. And this again has become sort of the excuse of the day for countries to justify their military adventures is to say, well, you know, it's for humanitarian purposes, right? Even look at the United States' military adventures over the past, hell, 50 years. They've all at some level been justified in terms of human rights. So all of them, I suppose, you could argue, you know, have an R2P element to them, even Vietnam for, for that matter, right? Uh, protecting them against the scourge of communism, right? Which at that point becomes arbitrary. And I think that's what we're seeing, uh, and that's what we have seen, and that's what I, why I think R2P is such a hollow norm, is because, and, and in fact, many of the small states of the world were concerned about this, uh, states using it and abusing it, basically using it as a pretext to invade states for self-interested reasons and have nothing to do with R2P. So states basically invoke R2P when it's convenient for them. And I think this is what uh, the Houthis are doing as well. They're basically saying, hey, look, we can invoke R2P too, right? Uh, Western big powers, right? So I think it's uh, yet another example of R2P being invoked at the convenience of the state invoking it, right? Looking for some international standard uh, that would at least plausibly justify uh, their interventions. Uh, in terms of the ICJ and, and genocide, I just want to point out a clarification. The ICJ hasn't ruled anything. They've issued an order for provisional measures, that's all. Uh, and that order for provisional measures didn't even include a ceasefire. Um, they are taking up uh, the, the genocide case that has been uh, brought to them by South Africa, um, but there's been no finding, uh, preliminarily or otherwise, of, of genocide. Um, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to what's going on. I think it's good that South Africa has raised this issue, but as sort of someone who takes this sort of thing serious, I want to be very careful about saying things like, you know, the ICJ has already said that there's genocide taking place uh, in, uh, in, in Israel. So, but if we can assume that there is a plausible case for, for genocide taking place in Israel, um, what, what was your other question about how this would affect like the United States and, and other allies with, with this? Um, so, so the I, the ICJ, the ICJ was it was not a ruling. It was so so there's there's something there about plausible plausible genocide as some sort of preliminary ruling, right? Uh, it's not a ruling. Not ruling, but some it, sort of prelim, say preliminary finding. Yeah, fair enough. Sure. Yeah. So given given this preliminary finding, um, justifying the Yemeni intervention, um, I want to. Uh, then ask, like, to what extent is the United States and the United Kingdom justified and legitimate in responding to Yemen? I see. Um, furthermore, given that their territory was, was not attacked, it was okay. their, uh, their free flow yeah, of yeah. commerce. Yeah. So uh, ICJ provisional measures don't provide justification for anything. A, a, plausible situ a plausible situation of genocide wouldn't justify someone using that as a, a, an official defense, right? Um, and let's be clear. Uh, Yemen is attacking, sending missiles toward Israel, right? Almost all of them have been intercepted. And it's also attacking commercial shipping, um, which is, you know, it's saying that, well, we're attacking ships bound for Israel, fair enough. Um, but it's also attacking other ships. It's attacking any and all traffic that goes through the Red Sea that it finds uh, objectionable. So it is actually violating international law. It's violating international maritime law. Uh, by doing that. And so that provides at least some justification for, you know, protecting uh, navigation of the high seas that uh, Britain and the United States and other countries are doing. I don't think it's necessarily uh, them coming to the aid of Israel, who is potentially committing genocide. I think this is an example of uh, countries like the United States uh, trying to protect free navigation of the high seas. Because if you look at maps that show uh, international shipping traffic, it's almost all but shut off in the, in the Red Sea. 
one of the most vital waterways in the world. There's very little shipping traffic going through there anymore, and that has pretty broad economic effects. Um, so I think that, again, what we're seeing here is the United States uh, trying to uphold international trade as opposed to defend Israel, even though, uh, admittedly, they have shot down numerous missiles fired from Yemen toward Israel. Uh, so they are, in that sense, providing them with some level of defense. Um, uh, we have yes. time for one or two more quick questions. So. I think there's one over here, and then, okay. I was a born scholar. Oh, cool. Very good. I know that guy. Uh, share a connection. Um, so specific to the United Nations intervention in Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. which was a case where the United Nations did get involved in a regional conflict, so a big part of that was the diamond trade was cut off, um, but it was ruled that even though they had diamonds that were important to international commerce, it was more important that there was a, I guess, a social, cultural, violent conflict that the UN needed to intervene in. So where is the line kind of drawn between using humanity as a justification to infringe on trade? Um, well, I suppose that depends on whether you, what you value more. Right? Do you value uh, human rights and humanity and standards of living in these countries, or do you value the prices of commodities on international markets? Right? Um, and maybe we don't want to know the answer to that question that states would most often uh, give. Um, so I don't think there's really, again, any, you know, so the UN uh, becomes involved. Again, I think we need to maybe think about what the UN is a little bit more. The UN is states. Uh, the UN Security Council is made up of states. So when we see the UN authorizing some sort of, you know, peacekeeping mission or enforcement operation, this is the collective will of 15 states at the UN. In particular, five of them that have special powers on the UN Security Council. So when you see uh, UN operations, I don't think we should be fooled into thinking that these are perfectly objective and beautifully multilaterally legitimate actions. These actions reflect the interests of those states on the UN Security Council. And apparently, uh, when the uh, operations in Sierra Leone were authorized by the Security Council, those states had made up their mind which is more important, right? Humanity, human life, or the diamond trade, right? Uh, and so I think, you know, again, states, states control most of the important things that take place in international affairs, uh, even at the UN, right? So, I think it was Samantha Power who first said this, that the UN is a building in lower Manhattan where states go to act like states. It's not this sort of you know, ideal uh, multilateral institution that provides perfectly legitimate policies that are in the interests of everyone, right? Uh, so that's how I would answer that question. Did, does that make sense? Or? I guess, so then applying that to the Yemen-Israeli example. Mm -hmm. naval trade, maritime law, we're breaking that law, to do right to protect? Does that delegitimize their use of violence if it actually legitimized the use of violence and intervention right. in Sierra Leone? I would question whether or not attacking shipping traffic in the Red Sea is actually doing anything to protect Palestinians. That's what I would question. Um, which I don't think it is. Uh, it's deterring uh, shipping traffic from using the Red Sea, some of which may be bound for Israel, some of which may not. But they're just going around. They're going around the Horn of Africa and going through the Mediterranean to get to Israel. It's just costing more money. So I don't, I don't really see what Yemen is doing as having an actual effect, necessarily, um, other than you know, on, on international shipping. Um, does it delegitimate them? I mean, I, I suppose you could find a, a, an argument that if they're you know, attacking Israel from Yemen and weakening Israel's ability to wage war against Palestinians, that that could be somehow you know, justified as to trying to stop all the civilian casualties, right? But to couch that in you know, definite terms of this is an anti-genocide thing, I think is premature. Um, I think you know, f just on this topic of genocide, it's going to be really hard to get a guilty verdict, if you will, of genocide. Just because it's such a narrow legal definition, it's such a high bar, but absolutely, war crimes and crimes against humanity are without a doubt taking place in uh, Gaza, being perpetrated by Israel. Whether or not those cross the threshold into genocide is a much more difficult and very different question. 
Yeah, I think you've been yeah, patiently so, waiting. I guess I was just uh, interested um, in, I guess, how, I guess, I'm, I'm confused on like levels of ambiguity, I guess specifically relating to things like the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam um, with like, you know, US soldiers enacting that. Um, and I'm also confused, I guess, on when self-defense can be, can be like claimed can, can Vietnam then claim self-defense against this massacre that was perpetrated by half-state U.S. actors? And then, like, where, like it seems like this invoking self-defense claims is almost like a pointing a finger of, you did it first, so we get to do, you know, this in response. Um, I guess, how does that ambiguity change when it's, you know, half-state actors or in response to the self-defense act in, in itself? Okay, so the Malay Massacre, clearly a horrific war crime, right? Civilians uh, slaughtered by um, Lieutenant Calley and friends. Um, so this took place during, in the context of an ongoing armed conflict, the Vietnam conflict. So this wasn't uh, itself an armed attack for the purposes of Article 51, because there was already a, a war going on. And so any self-defense against that would just be defending themselves against you know, attacks against civilians and, and, and war crimes, and it wouldn't necessarily be part of uh, the regime of self-defense. And, and I just also want to make clear that, you know, if a state invokes self-defense, that doesn't mean that it can do whatever it wants. Just because it's fighting a just war in, in defending itself doesn't mean that it can do everything that, it, that its adversary did against it. It's still expected to uh, comply with the Geneva Conventions and other uh, use in bellow rules. Uh, so it's not a, a carte blanche, right, to, to just you know, lay waste to your adversary. It's not an unlimited right to self-defense, as I mentioned before. Is that? Has it been used as such, though? Like, um, so, I mean, it's, no, I don't think, so in the United States, clearly I think, you know, we can say what you will about the legitimacy of, you know, the American invasions to, in Iraq and, and Afghanistan, but that's a separate question from whether or not the means and methods that were used were lawful, right? The um, Abu Ghraib torture scandal, all of the, you know, war crimes that were perpetrated by American service people in, uh, in Iraq were clearly illegal and were clearly, you know, not justified. And I don't think there was an attempt to say that, well, these guys are so bad, we can do anything in self-defense to, to do that. Uh, I don't think there was really that attempt. Mo most states are aware that, you know, there is a difference between using force and self-defense and then committing war crimes, right? And one does not justify the other. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but everyone, please uh, join me in thanking our guests. Give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Enjoyed the conversation. <laughs>